what does Superflight, Birdie's version, Sweet Nighter, Spoony Bard have in common? They all start with S. Birdie's version. Well, it ends in an S. I don't know. I give up. What, what, what are these things? Anyone in the crowd? I heard an NPM modules. I heard a probably. <laughs> they are all major versions of Puma. You probably see, no, you probably don't actually see Birdie's version anymore when you start a rail server. Depends what version you're on, really. Birdie's we did at the time when we wrote the script. Yeah, Birdie's version was 5.6, but what's 6.1? Well, we'll hear that soon. We'll hear that soon. Let's go. Um, right, Puma. Puma is what it is, the web server for Rails. Do you know how that works, Selena? Let's ask the audience. Who here <laughs> knows the ins and outs of how... Of, of, yeah. <laughs> Who here knows the ins and outs of Puma web servers? <laughs> <laughs> Well, looks like we do have one expert here, at least. Actually, Michael, we have the expert here today. Really? Is that our next talk? The imposter syndrome is overwhelming. <laughs> the next presenter is going to explore the internals of how a pre-forking web server like Puma buffers and processes requests, what rack is and how Puma uses it to interact with Rails. Last talk of the day. This is going to be really exciting. No extra pressure. <laughs> and who better to introduce us to these concepts than Nate Berkepec himself, the maintainer of Puma, Ruby's most popular web server. Yes, Nate Berkepec is also the author of The Complete Guide to Rails Performance and Sidekick in Practice, as well as the Rails Performance, uh, Rails Performance Apocrypha. Is that how you pronounce it? Apocrypha. He has run Rails performance workshops for hundreds of developers around the world. But does Nate pair? Working in open source and different time zones, he says it's very hard to pair. That said, he has paired on Puma several times, coincidentally, always at conferences. Well, we are all at a conference with Nate. Somebody may be lucky enough to pair on some Puma, right? According to Nate... You actually don't need to be lucky. All you have to do is ask. So if you didn't bring your laptop today, you get another day tomorrow. <laughs> Nate Berkepec, how Puma works. Thank you very much. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Puma, but my day job is running a software consultancy that I call Speed Shop. Um, my job is to make Ruby on Rails applications faster and more scalable. Um, you can find me online. I'm at Nate Berkepec everywhere. There's only one of that name anywhere. Um, and I'm at Nate Berkepec on Mastodon. Um, and my website for my blog and everything is uh, speedshop.co. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is how you can give back to open source. Um, one of those things you could do is buy my shit. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Here's where it is. Here's where you can buy it. Um, I have, uh, everything's in English right now. I don't, I just self-publish everything, but I do have Japanese coming soon. If you happen to be Japanese, there will be Japanese versions of my content being released uh, soon. Um, but uh, all about uh, Sidekick, and pra Sidekick uh, Rails performance and um, scaling Rails. But we're here to talk about Puma. Um, Puma is a web server and rack application server uh, built for parallelism. Uh, and this was originally written by Evan Phoenix a long time ago as the web server for his Rubinius Ruby implementation. He wanted to show off that there was no global VM lock in uh, Rubinius. How better to do so than to build a fully parallel um, web server? And it turns out it's still actually useful when you, when you have a global VM lock. We'll talk about that later. So Puma is now the most popular Ruby um, web server. Uh, we've had over 260 million downloads. Uh, we get probably, I don't know, 50 to 70,000 downloads for every version that we release now. Um, so hopefully um, it's been good. <laughs> hopefully it's, uh, it's been good to all of you here. Um, and uh, I have really enjoyed this experience of being the maintainer of Puma, a maintainer of Puma for the last six or seven years. I did hear this morning, though, that somebody named Samuel Williams was talking a little bit of shit.
Well, that's cool, because to me, uh, open source is not a competition. I love that. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not saying it is for Samuel. Samuel's actually the nicest guy ever, which is why I, I wanted to put this slide up. He even has four commits to Puma, which I means I owe him four commits, because I don't think I have any commits on any of Samuel's projects. So I, I owe you. But one thing that does come to mind when it comes to open source is this extremely famous XKCD comic that I think we're all familiar with now. And this, this uh, CoreJS article, which probably most of you read in the last week, kind of got sent around Hacker News and the blogosphere and everything. And it was kind of another case of this like, story you've heard a million times of an overworked, over underappreciated open source developer. And um, I was, you know, it's not the first time we've heard this story, but I have to say I don't identify with this story at all. Um, I've never felt like this when it comes to Puma, and frankly, I think that the solution to this problem, which I will call hero culture um, in open source, that we are, have to be supported by these heroes who deliver perfect software from upon high to us mere mortals, um, I don't believe in it. And I don't think the solution to this culture is to give these uh, heroes, like, uh, make them poorly paid and give them kind of crappy donations so they have a second job um, that doesn't get paid very well. Um, one thing I did go back and check was this is the uh, contributor um, page on GitHub for CoreJS. And I think you'll notice that um, there really is just one person on that list. At Puma, we have, I would call, four or five people that uh, you could easily call some of the top contributors to Puma that are not the original author. I am the maintainer. I still haven't surpassed Evan in the number of commits that I have to Puma, even though he hasn't committed for like five years. Um, and this is a very different model. This is a very different idea of what open source is and, and can be. And I'm here to talk to you today about this model that I think we've proved out on Puma and why I think um, it could be a, a, new, a different way forward for open source. There are some advantages here. Number one, I think it's pretty easy to see. We have a lower bus factor. Uh, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, we have probably three or four people that could easily take over for what I, the cont contributions that I give uh, to Puma. Two, I think it's extremely motivating. I love working on software with other people, and the fact that I'm not doing this alone really helps me to contribute more to Puma. Three, I think it produces better software, and four, I think it leads to less burnout. Um, so ha raise your hand if you've never contributed to open source. Okay, raise your hand if you've contributed a few times. And ra raise, your keyboard, raise your hand if you've contributed regularly. You still do it. Okay, great. I'm here to move people from the first two categories to the last category. Um, I saw a lot more hands in the middle than I did in the, in the third uh, ask there. So I don't think it's that difficult. <laughs> um, there's reasons why we don't do it. Um, but if you do the math on this, there's about 300 people in this room. I would say open source is not for everyone. Probably most of you just don't want to work on code outside of work. Um, or you can't find a place to do it, maybe it's just not that important to you. Like, there's probably just 50% of you will never want to do open source. That's fine. Um, but for the remaining 50% of you, if I can get you to do two commits to Puma, that's 360 commits to Puma out of this room, that's more than I've ever done. Uh, or if I just get one of you to be a, a super contributor, then you would become a new version of me and I've just cloned myself. So that's my goal today is I want to clone myself, I want to create an army of nerds to contribute to Puma so that uh, I don't have to be the only person maintaining it. And this is a very different mindset, I think, than most people who call themselves open source maintainers have when they come to an open source project. Um, but I think it's just the math. I think uh, it's the way I can be a 10x maintainer is to create 10 times more of myself. But there is a reason why most projects don't work this way. And I think it's because we don't make the uh, experience for new contributors very good at all. In its best possible form, open source contribution is fun, it's easy, and it's a really good way to learn more about software. Um, you get to have your code reviewed by some of the best programmers in the world. You make a uh, contribution to the op uh, Rails project, you will have your code reviewed by probably 10 of the best Rails engineers in the world. Um, that's an ex extremely good opportunity. And so my goal with Puma is to make your contributions to Puma fun, easy, and a good way to learn more about software. Um, I wish more projects shared this goal. And so if you're an open source maintainer here today, this is uh, the flip side of my talk. So um, 
that's what I'm here to do today. I'm here to do the like Uncle Sam, I want you to contribute more to open source software. This is my call to action. Um, take a project that uh, you use every day, learn more about it, and start getting into that uh, GitHub issue tracker and making pull requests. And we're gonna talk all about how to do all of those things today. So, uh, one bonus though, if you do want to contribute to my open source project, <laughs> uh, as you heard in the introduction, if you make enough contributions to Puma, we'll actually let you name the next version of Puma. So uh, previous contributors uh, have named the Puma, the Puma version after their favorite jazz albums. That's Greg, that's this current version. Um, We've named them after like Swedish pastries. That was um, that was our other uh, maintainer, Dentarg. I've named we've na named them after a Malaysian, uh, not Malaysian, um, Burmese um, from Myanmar, the, 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 like uh, particular folk god. I can't remember the name of it, <laughs> um, but we, we'll we'll let you name the version if you contribute enough. But Puma's pretty complicated. Not really like complicated as in big. It's complicated as in it uses a lot of different parts of Ruby that you're probably not familiar with. Most of you have never really thought very deeply about sockets, about processes, about threads, which is cool because then you get to learn about it, but it's also intimidating because you're used to writing Rails applications. So, part of my goal today is to introduce you to these topics so that you will come and contribute to my project. If you remember 10% of this presentation, you will know so much more about Puma than I did when Evan asked me to start maintaining it six years ago. I basically had made one pull request to Puma, and Evan was like, can you maintain this? And I said, sure. <laughs> so um, you, if, if you remember 90% you know, of this presentation and then, and then go study for 20 minutes, I think you maybe know more than I do now. So this is my, uh, uh, my, my outline for today. I'm gonna go through the design goals and purpose of Puma because that's gonna inform how we're gonna go through the rest of the presentation. I'm gonna talk in specific detail about processes and threads in Puma. I'm gonna give a quick overview of the code and then I'm gonna talk about how to contribute to Puma which is really just how to contribute to open source in general. There's not really anything unique about contributing to Puma specifically. So Puma's design goals. Number one is more throughput for the same resources achieved through parallelism, specifically through threads. Two is that the battery should always be included without the need for additional tools, servers, proxies, or monitors. Uh, it's an, it's, that is not a design goal of, say, Unicorn. Unicorn says you should put a reverse proxy like Nginx in front of Unicorn. Don't, de don't deploy Unicorn directly. Three. Add less than one millisecond of overhead to every request, and four, keep it simple. A web server, what is Puma? I said it was a web server. A web server is an application that accepts connections on a socket and then serves HTTP apps over those connections. Um, so specifically, we're a subcategory of a web server called a, a rack application server, which I'm gonna define what rack is, but all rack servers are web application servers because rack is a protocol, rack is designed to create HTTP apps. Then uh, we have sockets. Sockets are endpoints for streaming data to and from clients. We identify them with a pairing of an IP address and a port. So we say, okay, uh, you are listening on the all interfaces 0.0.0 .0 .0 .0, uh, on port 3000, that's a socket. Uh, we create a socket for each new connection to our uh, server, and the socket has a file descriptor. Um, so like you have a file descriptor that's port 3000 or whatever on Unix. And um, we have different types of sockets that we can support. Mostly, most of the time, you're gonna be using a TCP socket. Um, and we use these underlying classes from the Ruby standard library to support these different kinds of, of connections. And TCP socket objects are pretty simple. You create them, localhost, port 2000, we read off of them, that's how we get data. Um, luckily, all of the internals of that are pretty much abstracted away from you in, in, uh, in Ruby. So we don't deal with kind of the lower level details too much in, uh, in Puma. Then we're, we're gonna serve HTTP on top of that. Uh, it's an application level protocol, and Puma only speaks HTTP 1.x deliberately. We've thought about HTTP 2 support a number of times, but we haven't found the benefit yet. Um, HTTP 1.1 has this great 
benefit of being a plain text protocol, which you can just read off the socket, and you just, that's, that's what's on the socket. That's the data that came down. So it's very easy to work with and understand. Uh, it was designed at a simpler time in the web. So I talked about how we're a Rack application server. Well, uh, what is a Rack server? It's a type of web server that serves Rack-compatible applications written in Ruby. So the whole point of being a Rack-compatible application server is I know absolutely nothing about Hanami, but Hanami knows how to act like a Rack application, so it will be possible to serve it with Puma. I don't really interact with the Rails team very much at all. I don't interact with the Hanami team much at all. We just say, we're going to support this standard. And th those frameworks say, OK, great. We will follow that standard. Rack applications are super simple. They're just objects that respond um, to call with an env argument and return three elements. One is the HTTP status. Two is a hash of headers and values, which is, turns into your response headers and values. And the third object is the response body. That is the response body. It's like the HTML page or whatever. Um, so this is, a, this is a Rack application. That's it. Uh, it's uh, four lines of code. It's a proc. and there you have it. Um, you can actually mount these directly in a Rails application. Uh, if you didn't know, all Rails controller actions are just mini rack applications. Um, so it's very simple uh, spec. It's like a couple thousand words. I don't know. You can go read it in about five minutes. So I highly suggest you do that, actually. The rack spec is very readable, and it tells you a lot about how the internals of rack work. So you define a rack application usually in what's called a rackup file, which is just usually config.ru. Um, this is Rails rackup file. We require your application with that first line, and then we use this special method run, which is, comes from rack, and all the run method does is it says, this is where my rack application is. So that's, wh that's where we expect the, uh, the object that responds to call to come from. Um, config.ru happens to be the default argument that we will uh, we'll assume that you have a config.ru file when you bundle exec Puma. Uh, so it'll just start Puma up and, and grab that. The Rack server calls the application with the environment hash. So the environment hash is like pretty big. It's like a ton of information about what the request said. It's kind of like translating HTTP into a big Ruby object. And it says, this is all the stuff that happened with the HTTP request. Some of these keys are special. Some of them are not. Um, some of them have like specific things that they're supposed to be in the Rack spec. But Rack servers, at their core, are just interfaces between these Rack-compatible Ruby applications and a socket. That's their job. That is, that is Puma's fundamental job, is to take this port 3000 on localhost to suck the HTTP off of it, turn it into a Ruby object, and then hand that Ruby object in a very specific format off to this application. So um, pretty simple. So at this point, uh, we have a mental model of how Puma works. We've got a socket. A socket has some HTTP on it. We've turned the HTTP into a Rack environment, and the Rack environment gets passed to the Rack application. This is our mental model of Puma at this point. It's actually just how any Rack application server works. This is how uh, Falcon works. This is how Unicorn works. They all work at this point exactly the same way. So Puma, like pretty much any Ruby web server, is a pre-forking web server. This is a kind of old model um, that Puma just works the same, exactly the same as, as Unicorn in this respect. Um, all we do is we start one process up. I call that the main process. The main process uh, starts up, and it boots the application optionally, and then it calls fork. And it creates lots of little child processes. Um, the child processes are copies of the main process. So they share um, nothing, technically. They get copies of each other. So there's no communication between processes unless we set it up explicitly. They don't share memory. Um, they get co they're a copy of the main, but they are not sharing anything with the main, except they do kind of share the socket. So when that main process opens up the socket and says, oh, we're going to do this, that socket object is passed to the child process as a copy, and so they're both listening on the same socket at the same time. So after the app boots, the child processes, not the main process, the child process will uh, listen on the socket and call um, accept, and that accept call 
is where it's saying, hey, I want to pick something off of this socket. I've got a there's a request there. Please give it to me. So this is a, a quick common misconception is that the parent process does this. No, it doesn't. Uh, the parent process is not involved with requests and responses in a pre-forking web server in most designs. Um, it's just there to provide signals and stuff. So in Puma, if you want to use this uh, pre-forking design, we call this cluster mode. Uh, so when you use Puma-W and you give it a number, you're giving it a number of child processes to create. Um, so when you say Puma W4, we create one master process and then create four additional worker processes. Um, so now we have a, a, a more complicated mental model. We've got that Puma parent process sitting off on the side somewhere. It's not actually listening to the socket or anything. Uh, we've got a socket with several Puma child processes listening to it. And each of those child processes individually, not sharing anything, uh, is turning HTTP into rack and then calling the rack application with an environment hash. Okay, so that's, that's where the mental model is at this point. Now, let's get to the complicated Puma part, the thread pool. So Puma, inside of every process, each process has one thread pool. And that thread pool can be from zero to however many threads you tell us. Um, and that thread pool is what actually calls the application. So we'll create uh, five threads, and each of those threads will be picking work up and calling app.call. And this is like the special sauce. So um, the fact that we do this in multiple threads is what makes Puma unique. So we've got a, we've got a work uh, array of like work we can do. We call this to-do internally in Puma. The thread pool is just like a bunch of threads that tries to consume work. And then when you add work to the to, to the to-do to set, that thread automatically picks it up because it says, oh, there's work in the to-do set. I'll grab it. Now, this is not like thread safe the way I wrote this. Like this is, this is not how Puma actually works. But throw a bunch of thread safety and fanciness on top, and you've got how Puma works. Now, how is it that this turns into parallel execution? Well. We've got this thing called the global VM lock, and that allows only one thread to run Ruby code at any point in time. And this is like, this, this, the words of this definition are like very specific, and I've written this in a very specific way because each word matters here. Um, it doesn't mean that only one thread gets to run at a time. I didn't write that. I wrote it's one Ruby code, one thread gets to run Ruby at a time. So it's like a special machine that gets passed around between agents at a, a border checkpoint. At a border checkpoint, you've got one line, you've got like five people that are like stamping passports, right? Well, if they had a special pass passport stamping machine, they had to pass between them. There's only one machine, right? But they can do other things when they don't have the machine. But they do need to use the machine at some point, and they, it gets passed between them. It's kind of the same, ends up being the same queuing mechanics um, that you'll see when you run Puma. But the main thing that Ruby processes do other than run Ruby, is to wait on I.O., wait on uh, database calls. So when you make a database query, there's a certain amount of time that you're spending just waiting for sockets, um, information to come back on the socket and say, oh yeah, select star users is this. That time is spent not actually in Ruby. It's spent in a C extension or inside of the C part of Ruby, and that GVL is released during that time. Um, the complication here since Ruby 3.0 is that the GVL no longer exists. Uh, now there's one VM lock per Ractor. So um, Puma doesn't use Ractors yet, so like it's the same thing for us. Um, but now in Ruby 3.0 plus, there's no more GVL, so we kind of have to come up with a new name. I don't know what, no one knows what to call it yet. So if you have any suggestions for what we should call this lock now, um, I think that would be welcome. And of course, all of this is Ruby implementation specific. I am describing the internals of uh, C Ruby. I'm not describing how Ruby works in general. Um, JRuby doesn't work like this. Truffle Ruby doesn't work like this. Rubinius didn't work like this. Um, so this is specific to how the Ruby implementation works. Um, in Truffle Ruby and JRuby threads have true, pure parallelism. And uh, although it runs the same code as it did in Puma, it works, different, uh, in dif it works differently. A Puma process running a 50% of time waiting in I.O. application with MRI and CRuby and about four threads 
can process about two times as many requests as it could with one thread. So like compare this against a Puma server running with one thread or a Unicorn server. Um, we can process about two times as many requests as we could with the one thread setup. So that's the, that's the point. That's why you would use Puma. This is not just Puma specific. This is like, why, why do you care about threads or fibers or anything like that in general? The only reason to care is if you want to serve the same amount of requests for less memory. So if that doesn't matter to you, don't use Puma. <laughs> or do, you can still use Puma in one thread, uh, but there's really no uh, purpose to use multiple threads unless you care about memory savings for the application that you are uh, serving today. OK, now here's our mental model. We've got the Puma parent process in the socket. Now we've got a, a Puma child process that's churning HTTP into Rack. But inside of every single one of our Puma child processes, we've got threads. We've got our thread pool. In this case, just two threads in the thread pool. Each of those threads is calling at, at app.call um, and calling your Rack application with the particular Rack environment. OK. Now we're getting into the real internals of Puma. Um, we've got this thing called a reactor. Its job is to buffer requests so that only complete requests are sent to the thread pool. The problem with that thread pool design that we sh I showed in the previous slide is, what if somebody decides to upload a 20 megabyte file to my server and they're uploading it on their 3G phone? If I just handed requests to the thread pool, that would mean that that, th that thread would be sitting there waiting for that 20 gigabyte file to upload, um, and it would take a really long time, and I'd lose 20% of my capacity. So Unicorn lacks a reactor, which is why you should always use a reverse proxy in front of it, like Nginx or Apache. If somebody sent you a bunch of requests for a bunch of 20 gigabyte uploads with Unicorn, uh, that you would, they would basically just take you down. Um, but if you, had, if you have Nginx in front of it, like the readme says you should, um, you don't have that problem because Nginx is optimized for that kind of thing. It's, you know, it'll spawn up a thread for every request. It'll be no problem. Um, Puma is like not as good as Nginx at it, but at least it's safe. And at this point, this is our final model. This is exactly really how Puma works. This is my mental model of Puma. We've got the socket, the child process, and then in between the, the thread pool and the uh, socket, we've got this reactor whose job is to run this event loop and take raw socket data, turn it into HTTP, and, the rack, and then the Ruby code turns that into a rack environment. Suggestion for you to, when you look at an open source project, use CLOC. This is a line of code counting tool. And what I do is I do it by file. This is the actual output um, coming from Puma. So you can see there's only about 8,000 lines of code uh, in Puma. And I think like 5,000 of that is Ruby. Um, and I love this because it gives you an idea of where the most important code is. The, the, the oldest and like most biggest god classes tend to be the largest. So it's a great way to like figure out where the important stuff is. And one of the things you're going to find in Puma is this ext directory which contains a bunch of native language extensions written in C and Java. So um, one fun thing to learn about in Puma is how native extensions work. <laughs> um, and uh, we've got a couple of things here. You can read the file names to learn what they do. Uh, we've got an HTTP 1.1 parser. We've got something related to SSL. Um, and there's a lot of code here, actually. There's like uh, two or 3,000 lines uh, in our repository that are not Ruby. So we roll our own SSL implementation with mini SSL. Um, that's, you know, don't roll your own crypto, huh, whoops. Um, so this is one thing I would love to get rid of in the future. The support in standard lib CRuby for SSL now is much, much better than when uh, Evan originally wrote Puma 10 years ago or whatever. So this is kind of an old thing I think I'd like to get rid of, but it's a big project, so um, we haven't made a lot of progress on that. We also have an HTTP parser based on Zed Shaw's original work um, in Mongrel. So if you go and look and open the HTTP parser extension, you'll see copyright Zed Shaw 2000, I don't know, 8 or something. It's like a really old file. Um, that parser, that copyright statement is also present in Unicorn's parser. So Unicorn and Puma are sort of like brothers from another mother kind of situation where we both took the HTTP parser out of, uh, of Mongrel, and that's the beauty of open source. 
That parser uses something called Regal, which is a state machine uh, library, I guess you could call it, that helps us to create the parser. We get to use this really cool syntax that defines like what characters we expect. It, it lines up with how HTTP, HTTP is actually defined in the, in the RFCs, so I find it very useful to work with. Um, that's how we uh, write like what defines a header fa a value, what defines a header field, and stuff like that. Um, but you do need to install it before you contribute to Puma, which I'll talk about later. Um, and yeah, we are in dire need of help here because uh, I don't write any C. Um, our second biggest maintainer, Greg, like knows a little bit of C, but not doesn't want to write it. <laughs> and we've got uh, tons of Java still that no one really maintains, and the open SSL stuff, all of us are kind of just faking it till we make it. Um, so if you have any experience in these fields, we really, really need you at Puma. Uh, if you want to show up and instantly become a hero, you could work on any of those things. Okay, quick code tour. Um, the, we've got a couple different groups of Ruby classes. This is the first group. I call it the server classes. Uh, these are like our god classes, like as close as we get. Like each of these is like 500 lines. Um, server is kind of the central god class that manages everything. We've got cluster, cluster worker, those are both for cluster mode. Runner is kind of like our base logic for how you start a Puma process. Um, and then we've got these config and startup classes that don't actually really aren't involved after Puma starts. Um, hopefully you can kind of tell what these do just from the names, but DSL is like our main big one for defining how a Puma configuration works, sort of def uh, lays out all of our config options. Um, and we've got this uh, binder class, which is that job is to uh, create, the so uh, create the Ruby objects, which are represent the underlying sockets. And finally, we've got what I call the request and response classes. These, these are like the ones that are actually being created and run um, as you run a request through Puma, they're the reactor, which we've talked about already, and we've got a client and request object. Um, a client can have many requests, so you, if you open up a connection with our Puma server, you will send us many different requests. So we create a new object for every request you send. And those are, that's kind of it. There's like 12 classes that really matter in Puma. There's like a bunch of other ones in there, but you just kind of rinse and repeat uh, request and client to infinity, and you get the life cycle of a Puma application. So it's funny because it feels complicated because you've probably never heard of, you, know, you haven't thought deeply at least about threads, processes, and sockets before, but really like the amount of code that's run in Puma on every request is on the order of like hundreds of lines maybe. Um, so the surface is not actually that wide and you do the same thing over and over. Um, I maintain Puma at a rate of about 15 minutes a day. Um, I don't spend that much time on it. Uh, I don't, uh, sometimes you know, you go, you go off for a day on a weekend or something and do some work, but um, I don't, to, to keep this main, uh, maintainable for me, I want to not have to feel, to feel like I have to do hours a day of, of working on Puma. So this is my goal and my suggestion to you. Um, 15 minutes a day of open source. Read some issues, comment on something, that's, that's the, uh, the level of effort that this takes. Um, most projects now on GitHub have a contributing.md, so that's where you should start. Um, I put a lot of effort into Puma's contributing.md. Uh, if the project that you're looking at doesn't have one, that's a good signal that they don't care about new contributors, and you should probably find a different project. Uh, but a, a project that has this file means that it's a project that's looking for new contributors, and so um, go ahead and give that file a read. Specifically for Puma, um, I have a link in there to my like Calendly that lets you book time with me. So if you want to contribute to Puma, please book a call. Let's talk for 30 minutes about what your experience is and like what, what are some questions you have. Um, but for my project or any project, you are free to open um, issues, GitHub discussions. All maintainers love hearing from people that want to contribute. That's not a burden. Um, so please, please uh, talk <laughs> uh, to projects that you want to contribute to. Contributing to any Ruby project is basically a set of like three to four steps. Git clone, okay, we all know how to do that. My specific project in Puma, you need to install Regal, the library. So we say that in the contributing.md, we just gotta install that. And then you also have to compile our, rake, our um, extensions using this uh, rake task. So you need to 
compile the extension which is normally done for you by Bundler. Uh, then for any project, I suggest running uh, the tests, getting that green, and then running a local version. So the way you would do that in with Puma is to either just in the main Puma directory after you've cloned it, run bundle exec bin Puma, and then like this is our test file. Or in your Rails application, you can change the Puma gem to pull from a path. So you can say, please use this local uh, version of Puma that I've cloned down instead. Then you can mess with it and try different stuff. One pet peeve I do have with new open source contributors is you really like to claim issues. Please don't do that. 90% of the time someone's claimed an issue on Puma, I never hear from them ever again. And then I know I, the issue never gets closed because everyone thinks, oh, this person's claimed it. Well, it was like five years ago, so you know. Um, just post draft PRs. This is a great feature that's been added to GitHub. Um, even if it's just like you added 10 lines or whatever, like just open a draft PR. That's a much better way to show, hey, uh, this is something that I'm working on. And it's not just about pushing new code. Um, another common misconception of open source is that you have to be like this hero coder that will type it 300 words per minute and like, you know, push tons of code. And, and um, it's not the only way that you can be helpful. Um, there's a ton of different things in Puma that I don't particularly enjoy doing that are not uh, code contribution, and you help me by doing those things instead. Um, number one thing, this, this is not just related to non-code uh, stuff, is that I have a particular label in Puma called Contrib Wanted. And that's just a label that I put on things that says, I'm looking for a new contributor here. Or, I, I think this is a good place for someone to start. We used to call this like easy, but that's like a really bad label if someone then goes and finds it hard. Um, it's, it's, I would say it's like a low context issue. Um, all, most projects have a label like that now. It's a good sign if they have it. Um, if they don't have a label like this, I think a great place to get started in an open source issue tracker is the uh, 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 looking for reproductions. So we have a label that says this is a bug, but we don't know how to reproduce it. Uh, most other projects don't have that, but if you look at bugs and there's not like a reproducible set of steps, um, try to come up with one. Or if there is one, run it and tell, if, tell us if it works. Um, any bug report that has a, a reproduction on it is 10 times more likely to get solved because it's like the beginning of a test case. Docs, huge, huge, huge help. Um, no one really likes writing docs. No open source project has ever thought like, oh, we have too many docs. So <laughs> any project will welcome this kind of contribution. Um, and it's, it's so easy as a newcomer because um, you have the perfect perspective. You know nothing about this project. So when you sit down and read some code and learn something about it, just add that in as docs. Just contribute your, contribute your notes back to the project. Um, fourth thing, uh, and this is like maybe a little specific to Puma, is that code review is not just for maintainers. I love when people come into our PRs that are not maintainers and leave a review on a, on a PR. Uh, that's possible now. You don't have to have the, the big green merge button to leave a review on a PR on GitHub. Um, it's extremely helpful. Code review is probably one of the most time-consuming things that maintainers have to do. Uh, and then you can actually fix bugs. That would be my next level of suggestion. Uh, fixing bugs is a lot easier than other forms of contribution because it's like a defined scope. It's usually like, oh, this particular thing, it should do this, but it doesn't. Like, we've kind of already started the test case for you. And usually these contributions maybe only take one line, hopefully a little bit, uh, hopefully only one line, maybe a little bit more. Or um, you can backport things. Um, in Puma, we allow anyone to backport, uh, and we'll open up and, and open a new backport release if you go ahead and do that. And then Finally, at the last step, I suggest that you work on features. Um, so features are like where everyone wants to start, but it's not the best place to start. Um, work up to them. Do a couple of these, do a couple of these other things on the list uh, before you get to uh, thinking, oh, I'm going to make some huge new feature in Puma or, or whatever project that you've got. So this is my final list. Um, start with areas that are marked for new contributors if they have them, uh, reproduce bugs or try to come up with reproduction steps, write docs, review code, uh, fix bugs, and then finally work on features. Um, okay. Um, 
And then uh, finally, if you do actually want to contribute to Puma, there's probably a number of areas where uh, you might not be familiar with some of the concepts that Puma uses. So uh, I would suggest working with Ruby.com. This is a, a series of books that were written by um, Jesse Stormer a little while ago now, like six or seven years ago, but basically all the concepts in them and all the code that he uses is kind of timeless. Um, it talks about working with sockets. Um, I think he has one for working with threads, and they're all really useful things if you're looking at getting uh, into Puma specifically. I already suggested using the rack spec, um, and we have some Ruby docs that uh, you could also look at. And then finally, um, I want to leave you with this thought that also complements our contribution. When I was reading that article by the CoreJS developer, I think one of the things that I vibed with the most was like this feeling that negative comments were such a drag. And they really are. It's like the worst part of open source. And uh, we have this like bias towards the negative, but you do help when you come up at conferences. And we have Rails core team and Ruby core team members here and say thank you. Like, thanks for all the work. So thank you for your time. I'll uh, hopefully see you on GitHub in the Puma issue tracker. Or if I don't, um, we kind of have this uh, tradition now of having a table where uh, we hack on Puma and answer Puma user questions. So hopefully I'll see you in the hallways. And uh, don't be afraid to come up and say hi. So thank you all very much.